This conference will now be recorded. So there were some issues with the recording from when I was in Woodbury. So what we're going to do is briefly go over the same material that we went over this past Thursday night. And hopefully we'll be able to have the audio this time. So the first thing I want to talk about is where we're going with this class. So I know that some people have studied Greek before and have some idea of what it's like to study Greek. And a lot of people's experience has been, unfortunately, kind of a bad one. This could be because of the setting that you were trying to learn it in, or it could be how quickly you were having to learn it. In a similar manner, uh, a lot of people have had to learn languages pretty quickly, which makes it difficult, especially if you're someone who doesn't have several hours a day to devote to studying. So this class is going to be broken into four parts over a period of two years. The first one is primarily going to be Greek vocab. In the first semester, this will be spring of 2019, we're going to go over really about 80% of the vocabulary that's in the Greek New Testament. Now, to learn 80% of the vocabulary, you don't have to know that many words. Uh, depending on whose count you look at, it's somewhere between 300 and 400 words. That's not a lot, especially when you compare it to languages like Spanish, where you have to learn thousands of words to even get to the point where you can communicate. So the main thing we're going to be looking at is vocabulary. Um, we're going to start off with the alphabet. Then I'm going to touch a little bit on pronunciation, accents, and a little bit of punctuation. Punctuation isn't terribly important in the beginning because we're not going to be reading a whole lot of sentences, but it's good to go ahead and familiarize yourself with the similarities and the differences of Greek and English punctuation. After that, we're going to be doing a lot of vocab. And then after the vocab, we're going to kind of near the end of the semester do a review of English grammar. In my experience, most people don't have difficulty learning other languages because they have problems with the other language. The main reason they have issues is related to the fact that they don't know English grammar that well. So whenever I talk about something like, yeah, the dative is very similar to the English indirect object. If you don't understand what an indirect object is, you, I have nothing to compare the language to. So it's more or less to give us a place to start out at. So this is, like I said, spring 2019. Two is going to be the Greek noun system. This will be fall 2019. Now, the nouns in Greek are not terribly complicated. We'll be learning the four cases. Five. One case, some people think, is a subset of another one of the cases. So it's four or five. I'll also, at that time, just talk a little bit about something called the 8K system. It's not something that comes up a lot, but if you're reading some older commentaries, you might run into a few of those terms, and you'll look at it and say, hey, I didn't learn that. Well, actually, you did. You just called it something different. During that time, we'll also cover adjectives. and prepositions. And start translation. 
what we'll usually do with the translations is I will give you a sentence and I'll translate the verb for you. And then from there, you'll be able to do the rest of the sentence besides the verb. So that's fall of 2019. Spring of 2020. Let's keep this the same. So spring of 2020, we'll cover what's called the indicative verb system. So the indicative verb system is real verbs. And you'll understand that a little bit better whenever we get into it. But these are the primary types of verbs. Whenever we talk about something that happens in reality, um, that is in the indicative system. Uh, it becomes a little hairy, though, because... For example, you lie in the indicative system. You ask questions in the indicative system most of the time. Um, we'll cross that bridge more when we get to it, but this is kind of where you start getting into the real value of Greek. I discussed with some of those who were in Woodbury last week. Hebrew does not have very complicated grammar, but has fairly complicated vocabulary. Greek is kind of the opposite. Vocabulary is fairly simple, but the language has a lot of plasticity. Um, you can say things in different ways. We'll also talk about it at this time, how that the word order doesn't really matter in Greek. You can put the subject at the beginning, the end, the middle. As long as you have things in the correct tense, it doesn't actually matter where you put things in Greek. So the indicative verb system will be maybe not the hardest or most difficult material, probably will end up being the most work. It's kind of the most um, heavy lifting of the stuff we go over because you have to learn how the different um, verbs relate to the subject and the nouns that we've already learned. The last section will be the non-indicative system. And this will be fall of 2020. The non-indicative system covers a couple different areas. This is when we'll cover participles, the subjunctive, the operative, um, infinitives. And this is also when we'll go over something called me verbs, which are kind of the special class of verbs that don't really fit in well with the other section. Also, during this time, Lord willing, we will translate first John. Um, I will tell you, this is probably the most complicated of the stuff that we'll do. But once you have the building blocks that we have from the prior um, the semesters, it won't be very hard. The main things that become difficult is particularly the participles behave as both nouns and verbs. Well, by the time we get to this point, you'll have already had both nouns and verbs, and it's just a matter of learning how to put them together. If we do it in this order, I don't think that anybody will have a whole lot of difficulty and I tell people you can always contact me with the ISB Central Wisconsin Gmail. I try to respond. I check it at least once a day. So I try to respond within 24 hours um, with any questions. And if you need my number for whatever reason, it's 515-443-6387. Okay. So we're going to get into the first few letters tonight. Um, I made a conscious decision not to do a whole lot in this first lesson because I would rather you know things well and it take a little while than to try to cram things in and then hope something sticks. Um, 
that's sort of the medical school way is you cram so much that you hope something sticks. Well, that's why I get students that don't understand very simple things about anatomy, but they know complicated things about pharmacology. So the first thing we're going to do is learn some letters. And whenever we talk about letters, the main thing I want you to know is the letter itself, the name, the sound, and the transliteration. There's a reason why I picked these, and I didn't go into this in the initial video for those of you guys who watched it. The reason for the letter as well, to read the letter, you got to know what the letter is. The name of the letter is so that whenever we're talking about it and I refer to a letter, you'll know which one it is. The sound is pronunciation. And then transliteration is because most of the uh, commentaries, especially that aren't super technical, will use transliterated Greek instead of the actual Greek letters. In fact, even some of the more technical um, commentaries like uh, the New International Commentary of the New Testament, NICNT, I believe it doesn't even use the actual Greek letters. It uses transliterated Greek. The reason you need to know the transliteration is sometimes the letters don't always come out to what you might think they should be because they don't always follow the pronunciation exactly. So the first thing we'll look at is the letter alpha. Alpha or alpha. Um, alpha would be the more correct pronunciation. You'll notice I don't always do that. Um, the way you pronounce this is the A in father. So kind of a rounded ah sound. And the transliteration is A. Um, what I'm teaching is something called the Erasmian pronunciations. These are probably not exactly the way they were pronounced originally. They have been the way that it's been pronounced in um, most biblical Greek settings since really about the 1500s. There's some strengths and weaknesses. The primary strength is every single letter has a different pronunciation. So whenever I say a word for you, you automatically know how to spell it because since each letter only makes one sound, there's only one way you could possibly actually spell it. Another strength is this is the way that most people have learned it. So if you want to talk to other people about the language, this is pretty much what you are obligated to use. The biggest weakness is it does not sound like a language. It does not sound like something you would actually hear someone speak and say. Um, another weakness is you can listen to it and sometimes it, when you compare it to some native Greek speakers from Greece, you can tell right away that the language is significantly different. So you can't use these to learn modern Greek. The main reason for using these is, like I said, is so you can talk to other people who have learned this. And if you're listening to an audio file or something like that and they refer to it, it's usually going to be the Erasmian uh, pronunciations. All right. So after alpha is beta. Beta is spelled like this. And it's the B that's in most normal um, English B's. I usually say buzz or Bible. The transliteration is a B. I'll take this opportunity to teach you your first Greek word.
This is ABBA, which is actually a transliteration of a Hebrew word, which roughly translates to Papa or Daddy. So you learn two letters and you've already learned a word. Yeah, this stuff's easy, right? All right, continuing. After beta is gamma. Gamma is spelled like this. It's equivalent to our G sound, as in go. And the transliteration is a G. Now, I'll say there's actually a caveat to this. So gamma is almost always pronounced like a G sound. There are a couple of exceptions. And one that's kind of important is this word. Um, this is angelos, which is the word that we translate angel. Now, you don't know the letter for N yet, but the letter for N is this. It's called a new. If you look at this word, there is no new anywhere. Instead, there's two gammas. And this isn't terribly important right now, but a gamma gamma like this can make an N sound, and that's called a gamma nasal. There's a couple other things that can do that too. We'll talk about it more when I talk about pronunciation in a couple of weeks. I just want you to go ahead and get familiar with gamma does not always make a G sound. Okay. The next letter is epsilon. Some people exaggerate and call it an epsilon. Epsilon is a backward three. Spelled like this. And it makes the E sound as in egg. The transliteration is an E. One thing I want to point out about this, we've learned two vowels so far, alpha and epsilon. Alpha can be long or short. Epsilon is always short. Once again, not terribly important right now. I'm just planting some seeds because we're going to come back to this whenever we get to the pronunciation. Right now, I just want you to know that alpha can be pronounced a couple different ways. Epsilon is pretty much always going to be the short E sound as long as it's by itself. All right, so kind of a review. Now let's do this one first. Sorry, I skipped a letter. Delta. Got ahead of myself. Delta is spelled like this. It's the D sound as in dog. And the transliteration is D. The way you make this particular letter is a little odd. The way I generally do it is I start off by making an S and then continue it back and roll it on itself like that. Okay. So, so far we've learned alpha, beta, gamma, delta, 
and epsilon. I like to think of these first five as one group. They more or less follow the English alphabet, A, B, here's the exception, C would go here, D, and E. Uh, there is no C in Greek, there's just a K. So you can kind of think of the G replacing that letter. So this is the first grouping, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. The second grouping is not similar to anything we have in English. And it's not in the same position that you would expect either. So the next letter is called a zeta. Zeta looks like this. I've been told of different ways to break it down. One way I was taught was make a loop, then make a C, and then when you finish that, make the end part of an S. Loop, C, end part of an S. Zeta is not the true sound is hard for English speakers to produce. It's technically a DZ sound. Um, the way I was taught, if you want to get it correct, it doesn't come up that much, is if you put your tongue at the roof of your mouth, like you're going to say a D, and instead a Z comes out, Z. Z. That's the technical way to pronounce it. I know very few people who actually do that. So for the purpose of our class, we're going to pronounce it like the Z and Zood. Okay. I've never run into anybody who wouldn't understand it, going back to what I talked about before. There's nothing else that makes that sound, so you're really not going to confuse anyone. Okay. And the transliteration of Zeta is a Z. So after Zeta comes Eta. Zeta, Eta, and the last one's going to be Theta. They all rhyme. Eta is kind of like a funny looking N where you have this uh, part leading up to it. One thing I want you to notice is if we have a line, this goes below the line like that. The way I do it is kind of like a cursive end, except instead of going out, you go down. Okay. Eta is spelled like this. E-T-A. And it's pronounced like the E in they. <clears throat> Everyone looks at that and says, but the E in they is pronounced like an, an A. The reason I, I am teaching it this way is because technically, Ada is an E class vowel. And that has to do with how it behaves whenever we start talking about contraction. There are some times when it can behave like an alpha um, or an A-class vowel. But for the purposes of knowing how it normally behaves, you need to think of it as an E-class vowel. There can be epsilon, eta shifts, and that has to do with it being an E-class vowel. There can also be an alpha, eta shift. Um, those are a little bit easier to know when they're going to happen. Um, this will be more of a second semester thing, but the feminine nouns tend to be something along the lines of 98% of the time. Um, feminine nouns tend to end in either an eta or an alpha, 
and you can sort of anticipate when a one is going to be one or the other based on the fact that it's feminine or not. The transliteration of Ada is an E with a macron over it. Some of you might recognize this is the long symbol in English. Um, so a macron usually designates something being a long sound. So we said alpha can be long or short. Epsilon is always short. Well, eta is sort of the other side of the coin of epsilon, and it's always long. So we have a short E sound and a long E sound, and those are consistent. Okay. The last letter we're going to learn this week is theta. There's different ways to make a theta. I've seen some people do this kind of loop thing where they come back on it. I think the easiest way is to just draw a circle and put a line through it. Theta is spelled T-H-E-T-A. And it's pronounced like the T-H in those. And the transliteration is T-H. Okay, so the letters we learned this week, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, eta, and theta. I like to learn these kind of like you would a phone number, so I like to think of these first five as the first chunk and the second three as the next chunk. These, as I said before, more or less follow the English alphabet. A, B, G, D, E. And these all rhyme. Zeta, Eta, Theta. And there's kind of a story that people talk about to help remember it. There's a woman named Zeta and she's eating a Theta. So Zeta, Eta, Theta. All right. Our next class will be one week from tonight, which is the 12th. So on the 19th, we're going to talk about the next letters. Um, we'll see how far we get. We're, we'll try to finish up the alphabet. If we don't, we'll say we'll finish it up on the following week and also start pronunciation. Okay. All right. You guys have a blessed week.